the content and borrowed materials such as songs, stories, poems, pictures, photos, brand names, or trademarks included in this lesson are owned by the respective copyright holders and the teacher does not claim ownership in any of those. Our first lesson for this course will be all about the cell. And at the end of the lesson, you're expected to identify the proponents of the cell theory and illustrate the structure and functions of major and subcellular organelles. Talking about the cell, a cell is the smallest entity that can exhibit all characteristics of life. But before we delve deeper into the cell, I will be introducing first the known pioneers on the study of the cell who eventually proposed the cell theory. The discovery of cells stem from the conviction of pioneers who set in motion a science and industry of studying what can be seen beyond the naked eye, which continues to this day. First up, we have a Dutch shopkeeper who had great skill in crafting lenses in the 1600s. He is none other than Anton van Leeuwenhoek. And these were the words he uttered, probably, when he observed tiny living organisms and drops of water, mostly rainwater under his simple microscope. And he find it really, uh, really amazing. Leeuwenhoek, when he observed those tiny living organisms, he collectively termed them animalcules. And this is the simple microscope he used way back then. Despite the limitations of his lenses, as you can see how crude that is, Van Leeuwenhoek observed the movements of protists and sperm. The next pioneer we have is this man, okay? And he observed thousands of empty chambers when he put tiny and thin slices of cork under the compound microscope. And these are the cork cells he saw. And upon seeing it, he was reminded of the cell in the monastery. And he termed it as cellulae. And later on, is what, is what, uh, it was termed as a cell. And he is none other than Robert Hooke. Nearly 200 years later, in 1838, Matthias Leiden, a German botanist who made extensive microscopic observations of plant tissues, described them as being composed of cells. Did you know that all plants are made of cells? Definitely, those must have been the words of Leiden. Visualizing plant cells was relatively easy because plant cells are clearly separated by their thick cell walls. Schleiden believed that cells formed through crystallization instead of cellular division and concluded that each one of plants were made up of cells. Another scientist named Theodor Schwann, he's also a German uh, physiologist, made similar microscopic observations on animal tissues. And actually, after a conversation with Schleiden, Schwann realized that similarities existed between plant and animal tissues. And he used to say that, same with animal tissues, they are all made up of cells. That was his conclusion. And this actually, the, these two pioneers, their findings laid the foundation for the idea that cells are the elemental components of plants and animals. In the 1850s, two Polish scientists living in Germany pushed this concept of Schwann and Schleiden further, culminating in what we recognize today, which is commonly known as the modern cell theory. We have in 1852, we have Robert Remack, a prominent neurologist and embryologist also published convincing evidence that cells are derived from other cells as a result of cellular division. 
She said, I have found that cells are derived from other cells as a result of cellular division. However, this concept was questioned by many within the scientific community. That's too sad. But three years later, you have Rudolf Virchow. He is also a well-respected pathologist. He published an article entitled Cellular Pathology, which popularized the concept of the cell theory, which is essentially the tenet of the modern cell theory. He agreed that cells are produced through dividing of existing cells. Given the similarity of Virtue's work to Remax, there's some controversy on which scientists should receive credit for articulating cell theory. Rudolf Virchow's work eventually disproved the idea of spontaneous generation, which states that life can arise from non-living matter. Such he elaborated that cells can come from pre-existing cells and not just out of nowhere. Hence, we now have the cell theory, which states that the cell is the basic unit of life. All organisms are made up of cells, and cells come from pre-existing cells. That's the cell theory, okay? Nevertheless, general acceptance of the cell theory took a few years in large part because the plasma membrane, which I will be discussing on my next lesson, it's actually the membrane surrounding the cell that divides the living from the non-living extracellular medium is just too thin to be seen employing a light microscope way back then. Although cells were first observed also in the 1600s by Anton van Leeuwenhoek, the cell theory was not well accepted for another um, 200 years. And the work of Schleiden, you have Schwann, Remack, and Virchow contributed to its acceptance. Most of the contents and images in this presentation are taken from this website. You can have a screenshot and actually download this PowerPoint presentation from this website. And if you would like to source out books, also have here uh, these sources. You have structure, uh, textbooks, a general biology one by Bilardo, and functional biology, modular approach by Rabago and company. Okay. If you want to watch this discussion, you may visit my YouTube channel, Charot. <laughs> and if you want to keep updated of my next lesson videos, subscribe to my channel. Thank you.